thank you so much for being here. The audience doesn't know this, but you're based in Lagos. Yes. And you came here to Abuja for your own personal um, commitments, and you decided to grace us with your presence, give us a couple um, hours of your time, so we really appreciate it. So thanks, this was very important to me. All right, thank you. So I'll just really briefly introduce you, um, and then we'll get into the questions that we have. Uh, like I mentioned, we have our learners here in Abuja. We have folks who are joining us virtually. Uh, so after I'm through the questions that I have, we'll have questions from the audience here and also from online. Okay. Yeah, All right, fantastic. So please help me welcome Mr. Uyi Apata. Uyi is the Emeritus Country Senior Partner for PwC Nigeria, and Regional Senior Partner for PwC West Africa. We joined the renowned accounting firm, Coopers & Librand, which today is known as PricewaterhouseCoopers, it's PwC, in October of 1984. <laughs> and he became partner in October 1992. In his 26 years as partner, we served as assurance engagement leader in the audits of clients, especially in the oil and gas industry. Some of his notable clients include Chevron, ExxonMobil, and Oando. Um, he has also supported clients in the downstream and services subsectors in the oil industry um, and in the area of strategy and operations advisory service. Um, Uyi is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria, ICAR. And among his other business and professional interests, we is chairman of the Nigerian British Chamber of Commerce Professional Services Group, co-chairman of the Private Sector Advisory Group on SDGs, and a governor of the Capital Club Lagos, amongst others. And I really mean amongst others. <laughs> but most notably for us at MIVA, Fui is one of our distinguished Board of Trustees members, um, and so we are so grateful to have him here. Thank you so much, Fui. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so really quickly, before I jump into questions, I'll just like introduce myself super short. Um, my name is Anya Kewe, and I'm the VP of Operations here at Miba. Okay, Fui. Let's start from the very top. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, so, I know you studied accounting way back in the day. Yeah. Why did you decide to choose that? Before we start that, I'm sure when you are reading my bio, it must have been a test also for them to see whether they could pick it up. <laughs> I was really partner in 1992 and mm -hmm. 26 years. Of being a partner. So, it's actually 31 years. How many of you people? <laughs> it was deliberate to test your accounting. <laughs> <laughs> yes, talking about the, that, um, why is there in accounting? So, those days, I think someone just gave us the impression that when you're an accountant, you make money. <laughs> yeah, but I, very, I soon learned very early that that was not true. Yeah. But I, I think my dad was used to be a renowned Supreme Court judge. This mm. became my like, next chairman. And I used to see him was deliberate every evening, sometimes to be. Mid midnight and later I was actually staying back writing judgments and the whole thing and he wanted me to read law. I said, okay, so I'll finish school, then come and be reading again. <laughs> and the rest of it, so I'll jump with Gan, but a close friend of mine, <coughs> who have been friends for about 13, 14 years, he had an uncle who was a chartered accountant, he was in Lagos, he was the, old, the former immediate past governor of Lagos State that killed me and he yeah. said his uncle was an accountant and it was school to be an accountant. So, we decided that we went to study accounting in the University of Lagos. So, and I give that to one of my best decisions. To say. Uh, that's yes. what <laughs> um, so, you know, you studied accounting and then you went to Cooper as a librarian, and in just eight years, you made partner. What would you um, attribute to that success? I would have said luck, but um, I've just come from a um, sort of like a talk where a good friend of mine, the MD of Landmark Four, said, you create your own luck. 
based on the position you put yourself in and the rest of it. So first and foremost, but situations I present the different situations as it were. Um, I did my list service in Kaduna those days, mm -hmm. and very early on Kaduna, and it was supposed to be saying that you were not in Lagos, you were not in the best place of Coopers and Libra. But um, Kaduna provided me with a platform to do things way ahead of what my colleagues in Lagos were doing. So within six months, I was already leading engagements. There was a whole lot of excitement. I had people who really wanted me to understand accounting. And we collect that, okay, when I was talking to some of you here in Lagos, or when I bet you in person, if you were said within three months, or within six months, yes. I learned more in Coopers and Bagrat Kaduna then than I did in three years in university. It was just that whole thing of bringing business realities, putting everything in contact from what we perceived that to be pure. So I was really enjoying myself. Um, and, and so the situation was presenting itself for me any, any, at every moment time. The next big thing was qualified uh, in 18 months. And then the thing, thing was to go to, and uh, believe you about Jack Matt started, the enterprise Jack Matt started those days, go out on secondment to the UK. So I was really looking forward to that. And someone, for one funny reason, somebody felt that, you no, know, I shouldn't be in the UK then, but instead there were opportunities in Liberia. Oh. Um, at that time, we were looking for expatriate accountants, as it were then. And that's where I gave me an opportunity to really do more than what I would have been doing in, in terms of. So there were all aspects of what business of accounting was. It was just about understanding businesses, building relationships, and those. And the network I created based on the people I met at that time were long lasting and easily understood that there were no barriers to the time you can make partner. So I returned to Nigeria um, as head of technical and training and education and a few secondments here and there. I think the real opportunity was just there eight years, uh, eight years ago to make partner at, oh. at, at that time. So as I said, hard work, diligence, enjoying what I did, relationships with different people presented with an early opportunity. Oh. Um, I guess what I grab it to open up. <laughs> <laughs> as you should. Yeah. All right, so still on this theme of um, Coopers and Library, which then, of course, became uh, PwC after it was acquired. Yeah. So you were, you've been there for over 31 years now, right? Um, 39 years. Yeah, the 8 plus 31. It's a long time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's longer than some of our learners have been alive. <laughs> <laughs> How did you decide to commit to one company for the whole time? You know, it, it is a very, very funny question. You know, like, you know, no, man, there's a lot of them who show that their excitement when you say I've been in one organization for 10 years. <laughs> 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 I mean, I took over as regional senior partner about nine years ago. Uh -huh. or before then, my predecessor allowed me to be leading the session on new journals. So people used to join me and I used to say, okay, yeah, I've been in an organization for like, 26, 27, they're all excited. And this. Well, I just noticed about six, seven years ago when I said the same thing, there's this look, something wrong with you. Oh. What have you been doing in one location for, for that long? So I changed the narrative that no matter what, even if you want to spend one week here, you want to spend 30 years like me, it's just to enjoy what you do, be oh, passionate no. about what you want to do, and, this, and really understand what you're doing. So for me, it sounds like I was in one. Um, organization for all this kind of time, but it could easily have been made doing 14 different jobs mm. once every year. And that's what the accounting profession offers. Mm. But you need to challenge yourself in different aspects. <coughs> so whether you were one company moving from one department to the other or having different roles, you could see yourself play management accounting role in one organization. Mm. Then the next thing you're doing financial accounting, business analysis and risk, and it just seems like you're in a different job itself. So it's just what you do and this. And I was lucky, and I was very fortunate at any moment in time, I had those opportunities, the challenges of going into industry in terms of industry knowledge, oil and gas, mm -hmm. child of training for a long time, the leadership roles. There are some really, really exciting opportunities to work with some key clients, where I felt at any time I sort of like engaged a CEO of Organizations such as Exxon mm -hmm. uh, Chevron, my leaders, Brothers, and Vest, 
was so like I was master class of business. <laughs> straight with my directions with them and having this discussion. So it's, it's been exciting. I will do it all over again. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. Okay, so um, of course we have a couple of accounting students here. Uh, amongst others, we have other students here as well, but we, we want to be able to ask some fundamental accounting questions that you can share some like real life applications to. So what are like the three financial statements and, and how do they help your investors, these folks you had your master classes with to make informed decisions? Okay, now that's tough because I can't even get lost time and we talked about fundamentals of accounting. <laughs> so if I go up to track, those of you who just been taught you send your debit to you, Baby, you receive our credit, you give our and all those kind of things to tell you later, then you now go on track. But ultimately, I think the IS1 tells you about what financial statements you will be like, and financial provision, which is those days used to be the balance sheet. Yeah, um, you said IS, income statement. No, uh, international accounting standards, standards one talks about that you have the income statements and the cash flow statement. Those are the traditional ones, but you now have to the equity. But then um, you talk about the um, well, simple financial provision, which is just the balance sheet. So once the SNAP analyst tells the picture of financial provision of a particular entity at mm -hmm. one particular mm -hmm. time. <laughs> but um, I mean, you will spend most time, you, we're going to spend most time looking at all of those things and reading up about it. I mean, but what's more important is that without understanding that business, that accounting information being captured at one position does not make sense. Mm -hmm. So I can give you a typical okay. case. Somebody comes in before you and wants to show that you have huge networks and that tells you that, okay, I want to do a major transaction with you. You are normally like a five million Naira business, mm -hmm. then on the 30th of December, someone says, Okay, he wants to do a transaction with you and you're going to sell him goods worth 50 million. So, what happens is that you're not even giving him because you're going to put sales of 50 million, mm -hmm. you're going to put him as a debtor. Then, suddenly, your financial mm -hmm. position grows, but at the end of the day, that's what you really have the substance to understand that you need in that business. So, mm -hmm. it's not the, so beyond those numbers, there are other things you are taking into consideration, really understanding the real nature of the transaction and, mm -hmm. and other things. So guess what? At the end of the day, that sales transaction in a week's time can be reversed. Yeah. But it's already captured that position. So you have other things that notes, explanatory notes that are going concern, mm -hmm. mutual provisions and all the other things that you take into consideration. I'm saying all of this because people will see all of that. But it begins to make sense when you understand the real business of why those transactions are taking place. So you take a step back, why is this happening? Before you tell it to the user. Tell it to the user. So I, I think you kind of touched on some of these in this your previous response, but what are some more challenges or limitations that, that people will run into if they're just relying only on financial statements? Um, the, I mean, as I said, understanding the business is really, really fundamental for um, um, everybody. Mm -hmm. this is, there's been a lot of transformation I think, since I've seen it all in over 40 years, almost 40 yeah. years now. I mean, people are beginning to report things about sustainability, mm -hmm. wider issues, but let's restrict it so since it's accounting for business um, from the from, uh, from it. I think you really need to know, let's understand the accounting policies. So what's the account because you can change, for instance, going back to that same analogy I gave about those debts. So yeah. if, for instance, you have a sales transaction, a debtor, you decide from that, okay, my accounting policy says I should make provisions for bad debts when the debt is 365 days delayed. The next year they switch because it suits you to six months. Oh. Two or three years, all this person will collect them. So, consistency is really, really important. And then you have other broader um, issues in terms of valuation, so as I said, substance of doesn't really make sense. At the end of the day, as I said, if somebody says, Okay, I'm selling a car to you, um, and that car is a Corolla, and they're selling it for 40 million naira, 
it's not just enough to record it in a sporting manner. By the way, the new scholar, not the brand new one, is sporting manner. So you so really understand what's that. Mm -hmm. uh, so what the value is being created from that transaction is very, very key. Mm -hmm. um, and, and as I said, again, during a couple of weeks ago, uh, during the matriculation, like one of most of us here are in business, having an opportunity on a real-time basis to practice what we're doing. So, mm -hmm. so it's easier um, to, to, to put this in perspective. We didn't have so much of that luxury at, um, at that time. So just sharing understanding of those um, transactions is really, really key. Um, and the rest. Again, let me go back to this because it's instructive and that's been one of the reasons why I believe I lasted this long when it comes to my um, career. Um, but understanding accounting principles and concept and just cramming it doesn't make sense if you cannot apply it to business. Yeah. And worse. Okay. So I talked about my life in Liberia like, experience um, when I said well, it was life changing moments for me. Um, as I said, um, I was sent to Liberia. And then I felt I was the smartest person in the world, 24 year old <laughs> chartered accountant, expatriate. <laughs> so I was dealing with this 54 year old CPA experience and this was um, working for an oil um, rubber processing company. Then. So this is not only what I was every Monday. I used to go and tell him about sharing my audit text, my findings as it were. Mm with him and then uh, and I spent time using that opportunity to lecture depreciation. Do you know you want depreciated access? Your assets for like the last eight months. Depreciation is so so and so is you've not done bank reconciliation. The advantage of doing bank reconciliation is so so and so <laughs> I went on and fought me on fun well for me for me that and for him to, I think things went good later. I mean, he had to go and see his wife in the UK who had a cancer scare at that time. And he was going away for one month. And then he, he now went, so oh, there's this smart Nigerian guy who can act as CFO for one month when I'm away. And um, those days we didn't have all those the strict things around independence. Anyway, it wasn't a US secret entity, so it was together. So from a Wednesday when he informed me that I was taking over, so the next Monday I was sitting on that seat where the guy was. So that's where the cool concept of putting yourself in each. Sure. It was then I quickly realized in less than 48 hours that the bank accounts I was sending to, they were all dormant, so they were not really banked at that time to do anything. So I kept asking him. And I didn't really understand the business. The most pressing things to be at that time are Things around chrome rubber, the outgrowth, they're bringing the raw rubber, the rubber comes, the weight, you are getting the right weight. What's the right weight for the rubber? So you're not getting the right weight then. It goes to the production plant, the production section where you process the rubber, what quantity comes out at the end of those, those things. So then, how do you now send regular financial statements or management accounts to the owners of the business? So those whole things just was like, really understand. So it's like, I didn't understand it. So I wasn't going to do an effective audit. So you need to, so I, I keep hammering on this because at the end of the day, it taught me two things. First, about really understanding the business before you do anything. And second, the way they say, respect and putting yourselves in each other's shoes. So since uh, the age of 24, more than almost 30, almost 35 years later, I've never confronted a client with, say, I know it's all position about mm -hmm. how things should be without first putting myself in that person's position to say, okay, if I was in his shoes, mm -hmm. how would I deal with this matter? Mm -hmm. So I learned very early on not to be an arrogant mm -hmm. Cooper's and Librarian auditor. Yeah. And that's just sort of shaped my career. Um, today, so understanding the business is crucial and stuff and stuff. Transactions for everybody. I mean, I can't. I know your fundamentals of accounting. I try to come here to say I'll tell you about it. So I, I actually asked for it, but when I said it was three hundred and forty pages, I said no. I won't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> I told you it wasn't big me. It wasn't big talking about. <laughs> All right. Uh, so, actually, I'm curious to... Uh, this is for me, and I think that some people here are also interested in, in forensic accounting. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the topics of money laundering, and um, you mentioned already changing policies when it suits you. So, in your experience, what are some common red flags or, or indicators of bad practice, potential money laundering when you're reviewing uh, a company's like financial records? I mean, okay, in those days, they used to tell us things like, okay, when you have an extra dominant CEO or CFO, mm -hmm. just be where they want to browbeat you or the, but again, most of you may be internal, so I don't want you to go and confront your CFO <laughs> CEO and say, okay, yes, because you are. Tell me why did I not go to work in what committee for or something? And no, it's not that way. But again, you look at some of those, I mean, it's just professional skepticism at all times. Uh, again, if I'm, I'm sure I'm like this, because I know the audience will differ from those of us who are auditors and those who are really accountants in organizations. So I, I think for, uh, it just goes back to that thing about the, First, know your clients. It's very clear. So when they say KYC, 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 and sometimes they tell us we are slow mm -hmm. in terms of accepting clients. But we just want to know, understand clients. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so these days, who are the people you are dealing with? Okay. It's very, very important. Because at the end of the day, anti-money laundering, this, uh, I mean, with, um, with um, quick search, um, you can find out things about company brand rest. So that's, it's one of the things we do. So in terms of um, identity of the type of people we, we, we deal with, um, I mean, the anti money laundry regulation is quite um, clear also um, for us. But um, coming down to, to specifics, the red flags will come from the nature of the transaction. Just think back, will a reasonable person do this? Mm. Yeah? Will a reasonable person undertake this transaction? If a reasonable then there's time to wait to put on your professional skepticism. So if your if your boss comes in and says, Oh, that's analogy earlier, says, okay, oh, we've just done a sale of 35 million naira. Mm -hmm. The first thing you do, rather than get excited, if you are a What's the so maybe production company? Mm -hmm. yeah, so let me so let me say fast food moving producer, maybe producing business. Mm -hmm. And they say, oh, we just always say what thirty five million and record each other. What would be the first thing that would be about thirty five million? I mean, it's very easy to get excited to say they'll credit sales, credit the debtors mm -hmm. and the rest. And then just if you are not even careful with the rest of determine how to profit margin that goes straight to the bottom and everybody is Mm -hmm. Well, when you go back at night and say, oh, but where did they get those sales from? Our highest stock we've ever had, I think, that is five million of worth of goods. So how far we are selling? That's too bad. So those are kind of things. Oh, by the way, what did we sell it to? Mm -hmm. Yeah, but uh, we don't have money. How can we have money? <laughs> <laughs> how can we have fun? Uh, mm -hmm. That's bottom. So that professional skepticism and understanding catches things from the very mm. beginning. I mean, so I say that, but from the high level perspective, um, is just see where there's incentives, so where there's total breakdown of controls. I mean, we all used to say those um, things there where you have multiple, I mean, you get to see the way they talk about, at least listen to those attempts because you'll find out that I'm saying all of these now that we did not basic accounting and the principle is very very important. You need because that's what you are applying. So they are not they're extremely important um, um, for us. So when you see somebody, the same person who is having treasury function, is also doing financial accounting mm. functions and do dual roles and the incentive and environment is created to do those kind of things. So that's why when we go in first. We say, okay, we want to understand the client's control and the environment. So mm -hmm. where there is high risk of fraud. Then there's the traditional risk uh, components of financial statements where they say, no matter what, 
just look out for things around revenue mm -hmm. and revenue recognition. That that one, that, 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 that that's quite clear. Mm -hmm. Where there's high volume of um, tax, and these days we things very very that's when these days of um, uh, technology and mm -hmm. the rest. So we talk about it. I mean, again, the incidents of, of fraud and the rest have increased okay. more at this age than when we are doing a lot of things manually. So you need to see what you can do to address that. So what are the controls you right have out, out, out of the um, integrity of the system, so our financial reporting and all the other things? Yeah. I'm so happy you mentioned technology but in the context of you know the crimes being committed. So on the flip side, what technologies does a company like PwC use to detect some of these um, instances of fraud? I was specifically told not to say what PwC uses because uh, <laughs> that way some of the other competitors we have in here, but uh, <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> no, these days everybody, uh, I mean, there are tools, people, they have um, digital labs mm -hmm. um, where a lot of um, work is done in terms of analyzing uh, exceptional transactions. So data analytics will even just pick up on usual trends. Mm -hmm. yeah. These days, when you use a uh, to pick up on your chat. So, AI okay, can be disruptive um, in terms of doing this work. Um, but um, before I go back to let me just like this, because if I say AI has been disruptive a lot, four years ago, um, I read with the, I think it was the World Economic Forum, mm -hmm. they put out um, a study, and this was in 2018, that one of the top 10 disappearing jobs in the accounting. Huh. <laughs> so we actually, we had the privilege of being number five on that list. <laughs> <laughs> but guess what? Accountants or people who are doing accounting and this, because of their work training, actually being best placed or positioned to get to deal with these energy trends. Mm. So it's actually created opportunities for people to be more because of just that background. So yeah. that's where they were different. Well, in terms of the actual accounting, said maybe, but um, because now you have things that will aid you yeah. to in those business decisions as it were, but without understanding all of those, it will come to to not. Yeah. And, and so there are things around there. Even like people actually develop, develop labs where there's actually forensic labs where some accounting professionals are working with organizations such as EFCC yeah. and to see. Straight. You know when you want to do. I mean, these days, well, particularly money laundry, tracing the accounts of information, tracing the funds moving from one place to the other is very, very. Uh, so, so, but um, in house, um, we there are different uh, types of uh, things we we come up with. Uh, most of uh, the major audit firms or specific forensic accounting firms have come up with to detect some of those things. But to me, I always still want to keep it simple. At the end of the day, just prevent it, understand <laughs> those, those controls around that, catch it at that level. So mm. I need to test the integrity of the systems itself. So, um, mm. And the rest of it is similar to this. Right. And when you mentioned labs, are those digital or virtual labs, or are these like physical forensic labs that are being set up? Physical labs. Oh, I was talking about physical labs. Okay, okay when well, I was trying to get to do one of those things, like instead of physical Well, now actually, most of it, we have a PwC as an experience center mm -hmm. in, in, in Lagos. And maybe one of those things is when you have a, maybe site visits so or yeah. something like that, we can invite some of your students to that lab. It talks about everything about how they make emerging technology. So mm -hmm. you see, it's just virtually where they do trends. I mean, but data is key. Trends and there. So just it, it's very easy to flag unusual transactions and this, and then you now dig deeper and this to see how things go. So we have this uh, experience center that mm -hmm. it's not just lab like scientists do and say, okay. It's just all about data and this. Yeah. Yeah. All right, okay. Um, can you share, switching gears just a little bit, can you share some insights into the day-to-day -day responsibilities and challenges that auditors and forensic accountants in the firm face? Hmm. First and foremost, 
let me say it very clearly here. If you don't enjoy what you do, we are looking for something else. <coughs> because it's only when you enjoy what you do that you can overcome any kind of challenge. And that's been my overall principle. So mm -hmm. I go in, the challenge comes, I say, I've seen it, I'll overcome it. Then I say, yes, I go and over this challenge. But typically, um, over time, we've always talked about pressure. That's even be more intense when it comes to this time where we have uh, staff attrition. And it's, it's across board, so people mm -hmm. are significantly under pressure. We've sort of helped guys say we can help <coughs> virtually on some days, and this, mm -hmm. which has just been uh, sort of helpful. Um, so to me, I look at that from my own point of view. Um, I always believe that when you have clients and uh, we build a soft, strong enough brand, we have enough expertise to go in there and get revenue and do work. So there's the trajectory that we do work on. But what is fair week is that I say, okay, what are my people thinking? What are the challenges they have? Mm. And, and that's just one of them, just coping sometimes with pressure. So, uh, mm. Everybody seems to cope with a continuous learning organization. So no one, I've never heard anyone complain, ah, you have too much to read. And it's because you have, it's just mm. like real time, average technology, and then you have to, you have to talk about other things to, in terms of, uh, uh, now other people yeah, that you can talk to in terms of pair exchanges. Um, so, but um, some of the, apart from those, what we believe is just the pressure, so we encourage people to have a balanced life in terms of outlook and everything. But uh, I, I just think sometimes you cannot differentiate away from the wider the wider society as it were, some of the difficulties we are having from operating in the wider environment. Um, so we try to create a work, work environment that some people are actually happy coming to work yeah. in that environment. But that's, uh, this is, I've seen a lot and heard a lot in recent times where the Next Gen Council, Next Gen Council is a group of new staff who well, are mm -hmm. three years in the firm, a few, about five or six years ago. Every year they come and they have their own um, group, leadership <laughs> team as well. I first thought, I thought for some time that it was just going to be like a labor union thing, but it's far from it. Over time, I actually learned a lot from them. Some of the things they came up with in terms of what we did to do the really transformational and helped oh. us going for Okay. Back to that point, you don't have no it all. Get to get some things from the from the other people. Right? Yeah. So get some when they tell me to put to tell this office. <laughs> 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 what do you want with table tennis in the office? Thank <laughs> 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 okay, you, thank you. Okay, at this time, I'd like to open it up to questions from, from the audience. Um, if you have any questions from the learners here. Yes, please. Good afternoon, everyone. I have two questions for you. The first one is. Uh, what are the effects of bond and treasury being on Nigeria's economy? And the second one is, I have three questions. The second one is on forest. The second was the time that our forest exchange was the of a Naira to dollar. That's a, at the point, Naira was a 1,003 to so our dollar. So suddenly we. 1,000 what? 1,003. 1,300. Recently, just recently. It's not recent. I'm not giving the past. It's some recent previous days, recently. Okay. Okay. So, like, uh, so, at a point in time, we have that it fell down to 1,000. I want you to advise us, advise the country, advise the public listening to you that what do we need to do more to bring it down because they are shaped. Talking loud on the masses. That is my second question. And my what was the first thing? The first is on the bond and pressure bill. Ah, okay. Of what impact are they to Nigeria's economy? How effective are they? Mm. For those uh, who be investors. 
The second one is on forest, as I've mentioned. Why the last one is on um, uh, extrapolating accounting to lawyers. If you mention a lawyer, people know that a uh, lawyer is not doing only one thing. It can be into finance, it can be into estate, you can you can do your litigation and many other things like that. When you see lawyer around you, you see them, you see them as somebody that you can talk to, you can that you can seek advice from. Is it only one thing that accountants are doing? If not, why are they not ah, why are those things that they are doing are not popular are not known to the public? At the point in time I learned, I got to know that accountant can can have as an insurer, can have as an attorney yeah. financial can do many other consultancy services. Why have, why public is not knowing all these things? What is happening? What do we need to do to make the public? Okay, let me start with this third, which is okay. what's the thing by the way and what do you do? I think it's Monsieur Belay Kagana. Studying now in PSC accounting in India. Okay, so, 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 because again, um, you asked me um, questions around treasury related activities, which is outside the scope of this discussion. But because I'm an accountant, I'm doing this technical accountant, I'm a versatile in terms of because over time you get to experience all of these things. That's the point I'll say about having a business outlook. But I will bring you back to the fundamentals of accounting and addressing this question so I cannot just go off scope, but I can talk to you about um, this uh, proponent. So, but the last bit, I don't really have that impression that, that accountants are limited. Accounting of, because remember, it's a, a professional accountant, as it were, because I see, you know, I've looked at your syllabus, your syllabus is all encompassing. Before you have that, you can cover things around all things, financial accounting, there's economic subjects and all of the, all those stuff. So within our own organization, for instance, we have three units. Tax, an accountant is tax department. There's consulting. Within consulting, you have deals. Deals is different from transactions. Then you have corporate finance. Within these are all accountants. Then you have the traditional auditor or bookkeeping and all. So if you break all those, you have even 10 different components. By the way, guess what? There's tax and regulatory services. The lawyers even. So that's the first time I'm here. The lawyers are actually sometimes find the big four and say we are taking their jobs because we are providing legal services, mm. uh, whereas we just know regulatory services are on tax and the rest. So maybe we don't market ourselves more often than uh, what we're talking about. And now to, I mean, we're not better than lawyers, if not my wife and I are back in hell. <laughs> uh, but uh, I don't think all of them, it's all of those, those states, except those who are just, for want of a better, all around that. But I've learned from my experience that you don't just have the capacity to do it all. You must create your own area of You know, I'm talking about everything it's about knowing your business and everything. So there are real estate lawyers that will really understand the issues, not because they just want to sell property and get the legal, the tax, um, the things that so may have been. So I, have, I know the law firms we deal with, there are people who have areas of expertise to while they provide this wide range of services. So, I mean, for a long time, for instance, as I said, you've also asked me things about bank, treasury, and I'm not, done. the last time I did bank audits was I spent time in My main area was oil and gas, mm. because I had to specialize, because I was looking myself in case of, maybe any of you who decide to be working for me, I needed to understand the industry, understand the business, to be able to give this useful, useful advice. Um, and this. But going back to your, that's your first question. When you have the whole economic issues at the end of the day, it depends on what you want to do. What's treasury bills? What's treasury bill? What are you getting? 20% now? Eh? Bonds, the same um, rates and less. So do you make, do you have those investments in those bonds when tomorrow, again, if you have used that same naira and bond dollars, as people say, it will not be I've been crystallizing those returns, or can you put it into other means that can give you higher returns? So it's just business decisions that we that drive all of those, all, all of those things for people to make calls. I am asking. Traditionally, it was always good from the government and um, as a way of regulating the money in circulation, um, as it were, making more attractive. Now. Rates have gone high in response to um, things that are, and there's a lot of um, competing resources. Should you put your money in stock? Okay. In the last three years, or in the last year or so, 
there's been higher results. They tell you some people from some people have had 55 percent mm. increases. So you can put your money in bond markets. So that's from an investor perspective. I'm using this from a government perspective. It will just be. I think the major thing is for those people who keep on fiscal monetary policies and everybody working together. And I hear from those who have interacted with the cosmetic minister of the economy, all those actors coming together is what will help things, even like with foreign exchange. Foreign exchange, I hear what's been happening so far is a lot of speculation, uh, a lot of speculation. The extent to which that is happening is, is, uh, is not known, um, but some people will tell you if some of the main things that are in play come, come to fruition, we may be looking at something that is between 600 and 750 in the near term. Mm -hmm. But as I said, things that come, don't go and say, oh, we got a 39 year old expert accountant that says it must be 650. And after 600, <laughs> it doesn't happen, then you, come and, <laughs> that, then you come and tell me. But when you look at broader issues like production, because of the corruption around oil production, I mean, we still need to determine things around production, um, oil production. We move from an average of like about 1 billion, uh, 1 million barrels a day to uh, almost 1.5 now. When you start translating to foreign exchange and the rest, money be available to be able to defend the, defend the Nile, uh, the Nile then, then that begins to help. We've talked a lot about the bodies that were used in subsidy over time. That has been that has been limited, but again, because of the high price of uh, that, that has not really um, um, come through as it uh, as it were. Um, a number of incentive initiatives that um, government is putting in place. All the actors are working together, um, but I think efficiency of processes and there's even export. Someone was telling me the other day, it takes like three times or four times in time um, to do an export in Nigeria than it is in Ghana and other places. So you want to get some of So there are a lot of things and we need to have that outlook and pockets of things helping us here, here and there. Then more, more, more importantly, I was um, coming in from, um, I, I came in this morning from Benin City. Um, I was at the Edo, Edo Summit, which was the seventh for the um, governor of uh, and it's, it's last in office. And we're talking about some of the fact, some of the people who have come to Edo State to produce and taking advantage of gas that seventy percent of some of the things they use is still being imported. But it says seventy sorry, most of the things that are being imported, seventy percent of them can be dealt with locally if you create the right environment. Mm. So then the, the real impact of all of these collectives of all of these they come in the next three to six months then become steady um, and the main thing is for the policies being put in place, which is the policy being in place to give confidence to the investments. So talk to most of my clients, talk to most people in financial services sector. Most people are extremely confident that the right policy noises are being made. Yes, granted, it's not translated to everybody on the streets yet, but hopefully, fingers crossed, uh, I'm optimistic that it will happen. And uh, most of us and every person who is in a position to try and help those things happen, uh, she will Make join us. Yeah. Thank you for that. We have some questions. Are we clapping or no? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, have, we have some questions from the audience okay. um, that's joining us online. So um, I'll, I'll take three of them, but I'll take them one at a time so you can answer them. Uh, okay, so the first one is, as a business owner or founder, what red flags should we look out for when investors want to invest in our business? For instance, if the investor intends to use the, use, use the business to launder money, like to launder money via their business, yeah. Yeah, very, very important. Very excellent question. Know KYC, know your clients. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's very, very, you know, I told somebody, say for instance, 
we have this group, and um, it was, um, what's it called now? In this builder experience center, mm -hmm. where they develop um, different kinds of uh, products for our clients. So I, um, all this automation, and I say, okay, so you want to develop maybe a particular software for a client, and someone offers you $1 million, mm. and another person offers you $2 million. Which one would you take? <laughs> yeah? <laughs> One million dollars, you don't like money. <laughs> the idea, I like that, yes, I did it, but again, you need to understand who is buying. So, somebody, the person who is paying one million dollars, may want that because they want to have some impact in the Greek sector, how food, the whole value chain of how food can get to people faster, those people who could not take their products to market at the right time and the rest of it. So although they are paying one million dollars, you see that the impact is better. Than this. Then the person who just says, "Look, I want to give it two million dollars," ah, my client doesn't want to be known at the rest of it, and rest of it. Mm -hmm. The person may well be wanting to do it to commit fraud. Mm -hmm. So just know your client, and know it's your obligation to 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 do it. So that's uh, mm -hmm. so an excellent question because it comes to values, which yeah. again. I mean, I can talk to, I mean, just hopefully there will be a problem for me to mention it just before I close. Yeah. Mention it before I close. Okay. All right. We'll come back to that then. Yes. Um, okay. The next question is, what were the most difficult hurdles that you encountered during the course of your career? And, and how do you deal with difficult clients at PwC? Okay. <laughs> um, personal challenges were there. As I said, but again, opportunities and just enjoying what I did was there. I, I, I witnessed three or two trends of people leaving the fair, mm. where so some of my colleagues went to banks and made a lot of money. Uh, and many of them very successful, many of them with the same kind of values I have. And today, because they made quite a good deal, they're giving back to society mm. um, and that's something. But, there are also many who did not go there for the right reasons. Um, and there's also, so there's just <laughs> challenges of making that chest now for I new mean, faces. You're going to face it, what do I do, what do I not do, and yes, why do I stay here for a long time? But just think back and just to say, okay, what am I, why am I doing what I'm doing? Of course, some of us will be under pressure, maybe there's you're moving houses, just got married, want to make more money, and then later come back to a professional and the rest of it. But, it's always good to make that call um, at any time. So I faced those for a long time when I told mm. them, am I really making the right decisions to be here and rest? But difficult clients, yes, there are some of those, but those come from saying, everybody calling me to say, okay, you've not done your, that they want the account being delayed and rest. So I, I mean, those are because again, we've had a situation where if we go through our client's acceptance process very well, mm -hmm. the nature of difficulty that we will be sort of like um, um, less confrontational as mm -hmm. it were. But there are some clients who will actually call you and say, my team has not done any of these, they're, not, they're supposed to get the audited accounts that first match, they've not gotten it. Uh, you call your team and find out that, oh, somebody are not giving you information. Mm. Yes, but it just takes a lot of tact, relationships. So I think that uh, just trust one another. Go and have those frank conversations. Mm. I mean, so if you make a mistake to, and just having those frank conversations and decisions on what you can deliver is very, very important. So that helps you to overcome those challenges. Um, and as I said, I've had experiences. I remember once I mentioned them, and I hope I'll give you examples. I will not, will not be too much just chat around doing any research. <laughs> My former boss then, at three different occasions, said I should meet one particular client that we want to work for that person because uh, based on the advice received by their bankers, 
the bank has by way recognized that they were making a lot, of, a lot of money but not organized, that they should go and meet one of the big four to support them. And in one way or the other, they felt that it was uh, PwC. So my boss just said, I'll be a calm guy and we can go and meet this guy or something. But I spent 15, 20 minutes with this guy saying we can never work for this guy, no matter the money that's mm -hmm. Six months later, something else came. Oh, come and help us with so so and so thing. Since oh, they are really, the guy has changed and just, and when they are even more convinced that we cannot do things for this guy. <laughs> and there was a trend that was being done by the same. And today, I mean, in terms of reputation, and then the reputation is could have just been very difficult. So knowing clients, knowing the environment and the rest of the is very, very important in terms of knowing people you can deal with in terms of mitigation. But ultimately, calm disposition, remember my first thing, put yourself in the person's shoes mm -hmm. and then um, back to that first experience. So that's really helped me to be as calm as possible to address the specific situations we are confronted with. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for that. So. Um, I'll just take one more from the online audience, and then if there are more questions here, we can go to that. So, um, can you describe your process for handling an unexpected situation at work? Oh, okay. <laughs> unexpected situation with the clients or people related? Yeah. I think it's just, just you, must be, you must be very good at listening. Mm. I know. I shouldn't say this, but okay, let me say from the years I was partner, which again, as I said, maybe I mean, just over 31, mean 32 years now, I can't remember raising my voice in professional environment more than five times oh. in 32 years. Wow. That's just because you need to just be calm and listen to people. So you calm and listen to all parties. So back to your point. So accountants actually have these mediation skills that give the right balance that some lawyers may not even have before because they want to put it to us. They want to put it to you that this is no, so, so it's just being calm, giving everybody the benefit of that, hear their position, and when they trust you and see you have a balanced outlook and the rest, then it's always important. So the most difficult situations I normally face, again, it may not be clients related. Uh, maybe people, mm. and I'm just passionate about making sure that anyone who walks out of my office, which is usually open doors, and that's the same for most partners, that we try to discuss your matter mm. and agree together on how at least we should attempt to deal with those um, matters as well. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Do we have any? Other questions from this group? Uh, yeah. Abdullah. Okay, so my question is, what do you believe are the key factors driving innovation in an accounting organization like PwC? Oh, okay. Again, your environment um, will... Okay. Am I allowed to say the desire to make money? money, <laughs> 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 Yes, you are allowed. <laughs> well, I tell you, it's a very good question because <laughs> fact, when COVID was 2020, mm -hmm. in 20, mid 2018, the head of our advisory, Fabio Shinibu, came to me and said he wants us to invest in our experience center. Oh, there's this disruption, everything going on. I said, no, this is not going to happen. I'll soon retire. Why do I want to put in money? <laughs> and, and we did a lot of this investment. Believe me, COVID period was the big benefits we got. Mm. So those days, I used to, and it's the reality, imagine things, just be ahead of competition and the rest of it. So somebody was telling me, I mean, the, the guy, the, the main um, speaker today, um, who at our old students meeting were coming to get the, get the guest speaker, was giving a, an example of Blockbuster, the... Mm. Video people, yeah. and that when Netflix came, it says, Oh, no, 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 they are not serious mm -hmm. and everything. It was in 2008 that oh, we established our 2010 blockbuster. Netflix is to build a 60 billion dollar business. 
So just not wanting to be agile to change. And, uh, so what's driving this is just our response, our change, uh, what's the uh, um, just the environment and the need for those um, changes. So why would I today say I must still go back to 1984 <laughs> when I proudly went to buy my pilot, invested my hard end money, first salary to buy a pilot case. The only ones pilot case, those big ones, yeah. Because I have to put my all these files. <laughs> Very proud when I went to I used to pilot to an accountant. I mean, I used to go out to do a lot of different. But guess what now? <laughs> my pushy <laughs> clients in probation. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> so we have to make those changes. <laughs> to be responsive to all of this. So it's driving it based on clients' needs and what our people need to do to, okay, we said something, why am I, why have I been in this organization? So we need to make it interesting for people to say, okay, we want to be doing exciting things in response to challenges of what people are facing. So, so that's the main driver for us. Um, and that's why I said we invested in our experience center. And I, I mean, I don't, since then I've been a combat. So we have a group of people. Those days we had, 15 years ago, you come to the office the first day, the people are all, the guys are working in PwC. Ty. Ty. <laughs> Forget that. It's where it's Well, they make, they make, they make they a lot of efforts to really dress with Ty. But, Go to our experience center and you see the guys with the common jeans. Guess what? They are the ones that now turn us the other way. So if I was here with you, that be about 10 years ago, I've seen my lifestyle. <laughs> <laughs> well, again, in summary, response to societal needs and also to give us people, exciting career opportunities. Question. Yes. 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 But then the rate of successes are actually not that uh, much. So personally from you, how do you how are you able to recognize these opportunities that can um, create success stories? Mm. Okay, first and foremost is we um, our business we say okay, wonderful complex. Problems, societal making societal impact in WC and solving important problems. So if we feel that it's an important problem, because that's at the back of our mind, as I said, what becomes in yeah. If we feel that's an important problem and we believe we are the best people, then we we make those investments. So does it, everything work the way it is? Because this is just one component of the effort. Does everything work? It may not be. But what something that helps us, by the way, is because we belong to a network. So Sorry. I can, I mean, so I may not be able to talk. And that's been really helpful that when I come back, I sit, I make calls. I've been dealt with this situation before. And within the field of this network, 24 hours, someone will say, okay, they've experienced it. Or you now say, okay, you go into joint, uh, what we, we said, joint business relationships with some people to co um, GBRs. Yes, to just develop, to co develop some of those things. So you mitigate your, your risk as, uh, as it were. But the key thing that must drive it is just this kind of is, is there a fan? Is there a business case? Is there, yes, there must be a business case. Mm. You know? We do it for clients, so why can't we do it for ourselves? Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, okay. Um, I know you mentioned you wanted to come back to this topic of, of values, so maybe that will even tie to this question of, of 
advice that you would give to a student who wants to prepare um, academically and professionally for a career in the accounting industry? Okay, the first thing, again, as I said earlier, I need to read you most uh, enjoy what you do. Mm -hmm. um, and um, just try to make sense of it all. I mean, we were, when I was in school, those days, um, I used to, as I said, when they tell you the you know, debit, the receiver credit giver, and who knew was this, and you may not have to learn that. But those things were really complex as it were, whereas it could be a bit more um, straightforward. But once you are determined, a lot of determination, and you want to enjoy what 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 you are doing, it makes it makes that uh, much easier. Um, and the rest of it. And that's one of the people that um, um, was very very instrumental <coughs> to my career. It was my teacher, my boss, and now the kid partners. And he was, in those days, my final year in university, and the best the university there, not now. I mean, you know the best university now. <laughs> we have a very nice teacher now. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So I was in the University of Lagos there, and the final year um, auditing was Mr. Tony Enuwa. And he used to actually come to teach us, he was in. Senior manager in Coopers. I taught us all this. That was one of the reasons I went, actually went to Coopers and they carried himself. And then we provided this business outlook to everything. And mm. so they, they, so it was bringing that practical dimension to all the things about all they say now. So, as I said, most of you, I don't know how many of you that have those kind of the background in terms of what you're doing, it's going to make your experience better. And in this um, and, and environment. So it just puts yourself in that position to enjoy coming to school, mm -hmm. enjoy doing the research. And don't make it be, and again, luckily, the environment provides this, this environment better than what we had in the experience in the past, provides yeah. that um, kind, kind of outlook. Um, but um, for me, ultimately, I don't know if I have to sum this all up in that, but again, one of the things why have I stayed in Cooper's or PwC all this time is because of the values. Mm. That's just been very, very instrumental. And then there are many values are key to, to us. There. So, for instance, teamwork. Collaboration and that when you talk about teamwork, but well, you can't do it all yourself. Okay. So back to you didn't tell me your, oh, you said what you did, but you didn't mention. Okay. Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay, Yinka. Uh, I should come. What as Yinka said then about the um, the lawyers, you mm -hmm. can't do it all for you to be able to offer. Yeah, so you need to be able to collaborate. Yeah. So when we go to clients, in terms of clients, so we can go as. You go as team. So, <laughs> your friend would be better than you, so you need to be able to collaborate mm. and in terms of respect. Is there? I told you I learned faster and hard, and it's carrying me. Then I love putting yourself in each other's shoes. Yeah. As an accountant, integrity. Integrity. So, mm. I'm not who I offer, I can do something when I cannot when I cannot offer that. Yeah. And I'm not talking about, so, I mean, so that's why when I even said, talk to you about bonds, forex, and so earlier, I put it in the caveat because from mm -hmm. people's point of view, I'm not an expert. You know about it, so I put it in the necessary caveat and discuss it at high level. If I was to bring, who they are with, they have this ahead of them. Who is the, our deals partner? He will still be here and be talking to you about it. <laughs> and that's the point. Again, because there are, there are those uh, people there. So integrity gives you those things. Yeah, last but not the least is caring. Just caring for one another, our people. Mm. So how many times you call your people, particularly what we experienced two, three years ago, to say, how are you doing? That's a family. Mm. And uh, so that creates that support. So you're here, maybe most of the time. I don't know how much you are in person, 
But create that bond with people you're actually working virtually with teams and say, okay, yeah, let's not discuss. We're not discussing fundamentals of accounting today, but how are we just do that? Yeah. So that can guess what it will help you to do better. It's going to actually help you come up with better grades as we're doing that. We have people come back. All right. Thank you so much. That was a um great way to kind of wrap the questions from questions that we have, but also in this theme of caring, right? Uh, I understand that you are retiring next year. Congratulations on such an illustrious career. What are you most looking forward to after your retirement? Okay, you know, because I've been telling people when they say, oh, I hear you're retiring, you're retiring. And I want to retire. So I'm going to tell people that okay, I'm living to the next year. <laughs> <laughs> but um, guess what? Um, nine years ago, mm. uh, so when I turned 50, someone gave me a book, I think it's from, 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 from success to significance. Mm. So it was more about partner at PwC, working with the big clients, and then, but what do you want to really be known for? So that, so I think it's stock ticker. That was more like good personal success. And, um, and I thank God for that. But I needed to give them back. So I said, together with my wife, I set up one called Pets Foundation. Pets Foundation means promoting ethics through sports. Pets Foundation. Because sports was what gave me most of those things. I'm outside the university, I played cricket. Um, by the way, I'm now... For the past two years, I've been president of the Nigerian Ethics Federation. So, so, I am so pets, so I'm, and I also play golf. This two games, uh, this two sports, gives you things about some of those values that uh, integrity, mm -hmm. golf, golf. Yeah. You, you can't cheat in golf. And that's why I tell most people, business people, go and play golf because yep. you want to know your character, whether you're hosting card, whether you're cheating, you're doing all of this. So, those things stop me early. In my life, what I'm doing in cricket, of course, teamwork you can be the best player if the other 10 players are not in tune. So there's, there's teamwork, there's also a sports mm -hmm. So I, I went to do all of those things and because, as I said, what's the work I'm interested in? So I went to set up pets um, and um, the foundation, I mean, 10% of my income went to, from that day, went to this foundation. And I'm giving. We're giving over 100 scholarships to um, secondary um, schools from I mean, those people who play sports. And uh, the exciting thing is that where we were doing it in Idaho State, most of them, at least uh, eight of those people that have been through scholarship from their yeah, GSS 1, eight of them have turned out to be national cricket team players. Wow. Um, And some of them are also being sponsored in university. By the way, I told them about this was just before we started. So, okay, I'm not this not a marketing session. <laughs> we <laughs> can go, you can work so, <laughs> but, um, but so there are other opportunities for people who can play in this sport. And yeah. for, for instance, the national team is on the way for the World Cup qualifier in Namibia now. Yes. And, and many of them are academic school. But, I mean, the flexibility to provide uh, <laughs> the, the, the flexibility for institutions such as us to give them those uh, opportunities. So that, that was very important because at the end of the day, we went there, we went to IDP camp in Benin, mm. where we have about 3,000 students and now some of those, one or two of those people are playing for the state's team. Uh, mm. And just creating those, that kind of difference. So now, the Nigerian Cricket Federation is reaching out to 250,000 new kids every year. Wow. Last year, we won a global award in Miami for because we introduced 20,000 girls in Zamfara State to cricket. So, wow. it's, um, so some of those things, it's a kind of more exciting than saying, oh, I closed the $1 million deal with a client. <laughs> and I've seen, I've seen some of these things. So, it's, it's really more. so I'm going to do more of those and um, the answer to your quest question. And guess what? Um, I think the top with the business, I will give more of this. 
We would love to have notes. <laughs> and I know, I mean, this has been a fantastic time. I know that I have learned a lot. I suspect the books here, books online, I've also learned so much. Uh, we are very appreciative of your time here with us this afternoon. Thank you so much. Well, thank you so very much. Well, you're on camera. Thank you. Thank you.